Hi, this is Clive Criddle. I'm with Becky Cooper today, who joins us on The Current. She is the author of We Keep the Dead Close. So I'm excited uh, to have you join us today because this is the first time we've really had a chance to talk about true crime. And I was going to start off by saying, well, true crime is, is kind of a publisher's definition. <laughs> and I'm not sure that you thought that you were necessarily writing a book that would be designated as true crime when you set out on this detective story. How did you think of it about, about the story, which, let me just brutally praise is the story of an unsolved murder from the 1960s in Cambridge, in Harvard, um, and uh, your determination to find some sort of closure for that story. So it's definitely true, and there was a crime. But is it a true crime book? <laughs> I mean, I think, thank you for that question. I, I, and I think when I started out working on the book, I did recognize that the label that was kind of most obviously fitting for it would be true crime, because if you define the genre just sort of axiomatically as something that is about a true crime that took place, then yes, it fits that, that label quite well. Um, but I think, honestly, one of the reasons that I went with the editor I did, Maddie Caldwell, was because she was she was aware of the fact that the kind of motor of the book was trying to answer the question of who killed Jane Britton. But, you know, I think of all of the questions that could possibly be asked over the course of the research, that was maybe the less interesting of, of, of the myriad options. You know, I think I was interested in who Jane was. I was interested in the ways that myths form around an unsolved murder in the absence of answers, the way in which we construct our own theories, the kind of dangers of the stories that, that crop up, what it means to live with this kind of festering wound for almost 50 years, um, what it means to be on the other end of those rumors and how maybe somebody can surmount it by perhaps strategically relating to it in a way that any, you know, better than anyone could write it for them. Um, and so, you know, I think, yes, of course, the book is, strives to answer and, and ultimately does, I believe, who killed Jane. But I think the kind of portrait of Jane and of her community was really, and a kind of meditation on storytelling itself was, is, is really much more to me what the story is about. Can I ask you, um, and I know this is a bit inside baseball from a publishing point of view, but when you, when did you commit to the book as a book length project. And at that point, when you shared it with your agent and with your, with, with presumably several publishers, how much of the resolution of the book did you know? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I had committed to it as a book long before I'd committed to it as a nonfiction book, um, because I think a lot of creators think in different media. You know, some people think in terms of exhibitions, some people think in terms of, my old roommate used to think in terms of PowerPoints, which is besides me. But, um, you know, I, I think I think in terms of, of, of narrative. Um, but for, you know, I, I researched this story on and off for 10 years. And um, for the first kind of, I guess, seven of them, I hadn't met anybody who, other than the professor around whom the original rumor circulated. I hadn't met anybody who actually knew the victim. I had spoken to people on the phone, um, but I didn't know how much information I could, I could get about Jane. Um, and I think, you know, the standard of nonfiction that I hold myself to is, is one in which, you know, you could, I could tell you what Jane ate for breakfast, kind of, that I wanted, I wanted it to be so richly textured um, that I wasn't sure if I could meet the kind of factual threshold for writing it as that kind of nonfiction book. And so even um, in 2017, which is after I had worked at The New Yorker trying to kind of learn by osmosis how to be an investigative journalist, um, I was asking people, what do you do when you have 80% of a story? Um, and, and one of my ideas was to almost kind of structure it as um, an archaeological report in which I had listed what I found and then kind of bridged the distance in these kind of very overtly flagged flights of, you know, creative nonfiction or even fiction itself. Um, and it wasn't until after I left the magazine and I met with Jane's brother and he provided me with this cache of material that's, you know, every researcher's dream. Um, 
letters that Jane wrote back to her parents that doubled as her journal entries, for example, that I recognized that I had enough material to make it the kind of nonfiction book. Um, and, you know, I finished my book proposal probably six months after that. Um, it was very clearly nonfiction at that point, but the case was unsolved and it was unsolved for the next year. Um, and, you know, I <laughs> spent most of that year organizing the mountain of material that I had and just kind of putting things in neat timelines. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of writer that that's happiest when it feels more like I'm quilting and, and less like I'm kind of conjuring. Um, and so by the time that I got a text from one of the main characters that there was a major break in the case, I had really only written the first of seven sections of the book and kind of outlined the second one. And both of those, um, the first is about, you know, the original investigation in 1969 for the most part, and the second focuses on Jane herself. And those two remain kind of fundamentally unchanged. Um, and so I got to then incorporate the material that came from not only the reveal, but also the police files that were given to me as, as, as a result of the case finally being announced uh, closed or declared closed. Um, and, and, and I think one of the, the strangest parts of it was that structurally it didn't, it didn't fundamentally change the organization of the book as I had outlined in my, in my book proposal because I was interested in kind of crafting these constellations of guilt around um, the history's kind of favorite suspects. And I had, I'm trying to think about how to talk about this without spoiling the ending of the book, but I had reached a conclusion that was not totally dissimilar to the reveal um, that at least in a thematic way, the complete surprise and betrayal and heartbreak of the reveal underlined thematically what I had been driving at anyway. Okay, so we'll we'll definitely avoid <laughs> give away the plot. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to ask you um, I mean, that process is fascinating uh, about how how you actually had to deal with a story that is evolving even as you're beginning to write the the early stages. Um, and it was a very clever decision to write it almost as a. I mean, you yourself studied um, anthropology, is that right? No, I was I was a literature concentrator. You were, okay. Um, my advisor, but, one of my advisors, was anthropology. Okay, and and of course the the victim of the story, Jane Britton, was an anthropologist, and so as it were, turning her story into a quote unquote dig is, is a very clever little meta literary <laughs> trick, and it, it serves very well because as with any dig, you get to go where you thought you were going in terms of the main location, but along the way you find lots of shards and pieces that you couldn't have expected and you have to just make sense of those uh, as you can. Um, and, and as the book makes clear, you know, red ochre becomes uh, a very signal and mysterious element in, in the whole case. And we'll leave that there. I wanted to ask you though, so as a, as a writer, um, once you had come across the story, you, you had a long incubation period, 10 years before you really set out on it to, to render it. Uh, what did you read? What um, what other nonfiction in this space or perhaps fiction in this space did you read that, that helped you deliver the, this book in the way that you did? Because it reminded me of several things. I'm just curious to know what it reminded you of. And by the way, at some point, we have to ask you for a book recommendation this year. Yeah. Um, but the, w tell me, tell me about the inspirations for your book. Um, I think Maggie Nelson's Jane and the Red Parts, which was about her aunt, who also happened to be named Jane, who also happened to be murdered in 1969, um, was valuable because it was a poetic kind of philosophical meditation on, on a crime and on the kind of, um, radioactivity of of that tragedy in the people around that event. Um, I think Melanie Thernstrom, who wrote about another Harvard murder, um, it was her first book, The Dead Girl, that I found very inspiring. Um, I Patrick Radden Keefe's Say Nothing hadn't come out by the time I had committed myself to working on this as a nonfiction book, and I am so grateful for that because I would have been terrified that I had pilfered things from him as it is. You know, it came out probably in March, and I didn't let myself read it for a number of months until the, the book had taken its final form because it's also about an unsolved murder 
um, or an unsolved kidnapping um, that that um, reveals as much about the culture in which that murder took place. Um, but I think my my inspirations were as much from from fiction. You know, I think the things yeah, that are yeah. like O'Brien, um, where he differentiates between uh, I forget exactly how he terms it, but but real truth and story truth, and 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 if you were to just write things down the way that they happened, that there's this kind of boom down moment that it that that somehow what really happened isn't truthy enough, and that there's this kind of extra narrative element of it, and I think trying to tease apart different kinds of truth was 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 an important model. Um, I think Anna Burns's Milkman was really structurally key uh, in terms of a lot of the scenes in the book are these kind of parenthetical couchings of here's something, I'm gonna go backwards in time and come back forwards again. And, and she does that brilliantly. Um, I also think uh, Nabokov's Pale Fire was um, inspirational in that he, almost inverts the book on the reader where you start kind of digging through the book for clues and meaning and significance. And he almost, it feels like he laughs at you for, for trying to find meaning where there really wasn't any kind of authorial intent. Um, so those are probably the biggest inspirations. So I, I had wondered, um, partly because of the, the setting, Harvard, uh, if, um, if Donna Tartt had been in your <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I read that book with great interest. Um, it felt like a kind of fictionalized version of the world to the point where I wondered if Donna had heard a whisper of this this story and that that kind of set set her off on writing on right. writing a version set in the classics department. Well, so of course what both what both of them have in common is as it were the backdrop. Um, you know, fictionally in her case, a sort of New England uh, prep school um, which is full of, of gothic shadows. And and you have Harvard. Um, and it, it felt to me a little bit as though this story would not have quite resonated if it hadn't been set in Harvard. Is that fair? I think probably. I mean, I think Harvard, like 1969, was kind of loaded real estate. Um, that, you know, I think true crime is kind of akin or a cousin to an interest in secrets. And, and I don't think there's any institution, at least in the American imagination, that occupies a greater sense of, of mystique and of kind of secret holding than, than Harvard. And, and I think what's interesting, too, is that it's, it's something that Harvard as an institution doesn't seek to dispel about itself, that there is a power that comes from being seen as this ultimate ivory tower. Um, and, and one of the things that I was interested in deconstructing was not only that seductiveness, but also the kind of non-obvious slippery villainy that that allows and, and kind of fosters. Yeah, there's definitely a sinister quality that you suggest is present there. Um, and I'm going to ask you maybe to to talk a little bit about that in just a second. But I, I, I wanted to talk first about um, one of the characters, this is not giving away too much in the book, one of the characters who you introduced pretty early on as a potential suspect, and he's one of the professors there. Uh, the exotically named Karl Lambert Karlovsky. And you kind of give him the treatment. I mean, albeit vicariously through reporting from other people, he's wearing a gown, he's flitting vampirically down the hallways, he's bad-tempered, he's grouchy, he's mysterious in that he doesn't seem to publish much, but he has a strange hold over his students. Now, um, he's a great character, he's a great figure. Um, did you feel that you were setting him up a little bit at the beginning of the book? I mean, is he all those things and then more, or is that just the perspective that people have when they see him from distance and then that that becomes more developed as they know him better? I will say I didn't go into the story wanting him to be guilty. To back up a little bit, the, the, the reason that I was intrigued by him as a character um, was because when I first heard the story of Jane Britton. I had heard it as a kind of academic horror story in which it was almost certain that her advisor, this Carl Lambert Karlovsky, had been the one to kill her because allegedly that they had had an affair um, and Jane was unwilling to let it go and he couldn't have that. Um, 
And then a year later, I hear the story corroborated by people within the anthropology department. And they turn to me and they say, you know, that professor that you're talking about, he's still on faculty. And so it felt to me at that point that it, it, it wasn't so much a mystery as it was a kind of open secret. And I felt unwilling to, you know, relegate this to a whisper in the hallway. You know, either we were letting a murderer walk free and, and, and have these whispers be sufficient, or we were letting an imperfect man be imprisoned by, by these stories we were telling about them. And so, you know, for me, my interest in him was trying to understand, obviously, the truth of, of, of that rumor. Um, and if it turned out as, you know, this isn't really spoiling anything because this comes pretty early on, as it, it turns out that he didn't commit the murder, then the question, you know, kind of forks and becomes, all right, if he didn't do it, then who did? But if he didn't do it, then why was this the version of history that we had decided to land on? Um, and also, you know, how was he able to survive a rumor about this that for 45, 49 years had, had tracked him as this kind of dust cloud. And, and I was really fascinated by what kind of person can survive it. And if it was true that, you know, the other half of, of the rumor was that he had this kind of strategic relationship to the, to the rumor in which, you know, perhaps in the anthropology department, as many people had told me, it was equally powerful to be feared as it was to be respected. And that this rumor about his having killed a graduate student lent him this kind of dark prestige and, and, and trying to disentangle the two for me, whether this was something we had kind of read onto him or whether this was something in order to gain power or to just surmount this otherwise horrible rumor that, that might have buried him um, was something that I was terribly interested in, in trying to disentangle. Yeah, I think that comes out very powerfully. And, and this part of why Harvard as the background is, is in a way sinister, because it's not clear whether Harvard has aided and abetted some of the rumor mongering or indeed some of the habits of long tenured academics so that they almost make themselves into somewhat sinister characters. And I think the book deals with that in a very very wonderful way, actually. Um, I couldn't help feeling that if uh, these rumors had alighted on uh, an academic today at Harvard, if you were, if you were, um, if you were said to have gone on a research trip with a group of students to, well, in the case of Jane Britain, it was Iran, I think, or mm -hmm. Persia then. Um, and to have had a sexual relationship with a student and then a messy breakup when you've returned to Harvard, that there's no way that a professor would survive that now. Um, is that fair or do you think they might? No, I mean, I think, you know, part of the reason why Jane's story, I think, remained so alive within the anthropology, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the reason why her, Jane's story remained so alive within the anthropology community was because I think versions of that story, you know, ones that don't end with, and the woman was killed, but stories that, you know, have an affair between a, a student and a professor, oftentimes, um, you know, there was just a story that that came out in, in May of this year, with allegations of serial sexual misconduct by three of the male tenure professors in the anthropology department. Um, and you know, for instance, one of those professors um, had been accused by multiple people of sexual coercion, some of which was instigated on a dig when your vulnerabilities as a graduate student or as a non-tenured professor or as an undergraduate are the most heightened because, you know, you, not only are you dependent on this person for recommendation letters, but you're also dependent on them for food, for lodging, for your, your transportation home. And so, you know, I think the Jane Britton's murder for me became a kind of gateway into understanding um, gender discrimination and, and, and this culture of fear and silence in academia. Um, when I, I spoke to one of the original people who had corroborated the story for me and I asked her to repeat it to me, and she looked at me and she said, which story are you referring to? And I couldn't understand because how many murders could possibly 
um, have taken place in the anthropology department. But what she meant is there are so many stories that end this way where, you know, something transpires between a graduate student, usually female, and their senior professor, professor usually male. And the stories always end the same way, which is that you never hear from the girl again. And, and while, while Jane's story is, you know, a much more extreme version of that silencing, uh, you know, I think it became more and more apparent to me that I wasn't just talking about injustice that happened or silencing that happened on one particular night in 1969, but in fact that I was talking about this kind of systemic silencing that happens even to this day. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you one more example, which is that um, this a uh, former graduate student named Jade Deplom Geddes this year wanted to come forward with allegations against one of those three professors and had talked to colleagues in her department now. And one of them who is basically in her cohort and she's only a few years older than me, told her, do not come forward with the story. Please do not come forward with the story because all you're going to do is tarnish Harvard's reputation and we've worked so hard for this. So I would love to know uh, if you felt like sharing with us where you see your writing career taking you next, <laughs> because you could stay in broadly speaking in this area. You could uh, you could probably have a career of uh, uncovering revolting uh, university mysteries, um, or go almost any other direction. So what what are you thinking? Um, I mean, I think on the one hand this book led me to the frontier of all these other stories that I recognize now need to be told. And I think I'm at the point right now asking myself whether I'm the best person to tell this story or whether my job here is to find a journalist who is hungry and ambitious and is going to go after this with the kind of emotional devotion that it requires. Um, I'm leaning kind of to the latter now because my interest, um, I have to say, is 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 somewhere in the world of science um, that, that I think toward the end of the book, DNA comes in in a very powerful way. And I really got carried away in the research in a way that is ultimately reflected in the book on the subjectivity of DNA analysis. And I think um, there's something very powerful about explaining science as a human effort. Um, I think all of my books, this is my second one, have been in many ways looking at the subjectivity of of a profession that we otherwise just kind of accept wholesale. My first one was, you know, kind of rejecting the cartographer as the ultimate authority on, on what a place looks like. This one is about kind of second guessing the ways in which the detective, the historian, um, and the archeologist reconstruct the past. Um, and, and there's a kind of little like spidey sense somewhere in the world of science for me right now, I'm trying to maybe, look at that in earnest and, 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 and dive as deeply as possible. I just want to say I really, I enjoyed your book a lot. And I, as a, you know, I'm a publisher, but uh, one of the sister imprints to the one that published you. And I'm very interested in books that do what yours does, which is use the crime vehicle in some way in order to do a lot of other work. Uh, around the edges or underneath or around the back or whatever it is. Um, and so, uh, although I read your book too quickly um, in, in order to get, <laughs> get ready for this, uh, I just want to say I, I really enjoyed it and um, I hope it does very well. And I, I hope that whatever opens up for you next is going to be similarly multidimensional and intriguing. Really, really nice meeting you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Bye, Charles. Bye, Clive. Hachette.